That's what it sounded like this week at an Aroma Espresso Bar location in downtown Toronto. And special thanks to our own Phoebe maltz Bovi for the sound recording. Now, this site is still operating on University Avenue, and it's one of about 35 stores now open in Canada. Aroma has a lot smaller footprint since the Israeli coffee chain first dipped its toes into the Canadian scene over 15 years ago. Canada's very first Aroma Espresso Bar opened just a short drive away from this one. It was on Bloor Street West in the city's annex neighborhood, near where the Bloor Hot Dog Cinema is now. That location was a bold choice because the same corner would also boast a Starbucks and a second cup coffee. But the flagship Aroma store lasted for nearly 12 years, although it did go through a series of owners and, according to media reports, was eventually locked out by the landlord, leaving behind unpaid rent to the tune of about $25,000. Last week, we reported on the $10 million legal dispute now before the courts between the Israeli head office and Aroma's original Canadian founders who brought the franchise to Toronto. It's a saga that artist and musician Phil Kuntz has been watching closely. Kuntz is 100% sure he was Aroma's first Canadian customer ever. He was one of their most loyal ones. He's even written poetry about Aroma. And he has his own views on what happened. They did grow very quickly. And that was probably another reason why they, you know, they, they rose fast and hard and they fell hard. And there may be just a sort of a universal law that dictates that sort of thing. I'm Ellen Besner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Tuesday, February the 14th, 2023. Welcome to the CJN Daily, a podcast of the Canadian Jewish News, sponsored by Metropia. <music> Well, with the lawsuit still before the courts, lawyers for both sides are still doing all the talking for their clients, including the former Canadian master franchisors, Earl Gorman and Anat Davidson, as well as for head office. So joining me now is Phil Kuntz, self-declared Aroma fan. He lived in the annex for years until he moved north to Egbert, Ontario, just south of Barrie, where he lives now. Well, I'm so glad to meet you because uh, our listeners will be interested to know that you are considered the first customer of Aroma when it opened its store in Toronto's annex on Bloor Street. It was a while ago, but forgive my failing memory. The only thing I do remember for sure is I was the first customer because Roy handed me a coffee when I went in their first day of opening and said, you're the first customer. I took (laughs) his word for it. And do you remember what size and kind of coffee you got? I always get a small and creature of bad habits. And uh, I always get a small coffee, the smallest they have, and to stay in a clay cup. That's my order. And it was thousands of times. It's kind of funny, actually, because some of the baristas there said, you know, they get used to it and say, don't you want to try something else just once? No, no, I don't. That's what I want. And one young lady actually got very angry with me because I wouldn't succumb to her admonitions. and. Um, I thought it was kind of amusing. I hope she did too. And you went there every day for how many years? Well, you know, uh, I do travel and that kind of thing. But every time I was in town, every, pretty much every day I was in town, I don't think I missed a day um, for at least 10 years, if not 11, perhaps 12, until closure. I'm going, okay, just let me do quick math here. They closed 2019. Okay, that was 2009. Well, I guess a good 12, 13 years, huh? Yeah. And what was it about Aroma there at that location in Toronto that made you come back? Well, you said how many 10,000 coffees, whatever, so many yeah. times. Actually, I've had some some sort of, we, we debriefed on this, some of the, uh, the, the former Aroma Hawks and myself. What it set it apart from virtually every other place in the city, including other Aroma franchises, was the bar, the actual bar in the place. It was about, I'm going to go 10 meters, probably it seemed like so. It went on forever, a solid wood thing in a slight V shape. And uh, it was the place where you could hang out. It's uh, bars of that sort in coffee shops are like the standing zinc bars they have in Italy and France and all the rest of it. Very important for, for customers who don't want to commit to a table. And I'm that guy. And the cronies, which seemed to develop around that bar, 
we're of a similar mindset. We just don't want to go to tables. Um, nope, the bar was the place. You could chat with the baristas. It was just that kind of that atmosphere, that welcoming atmosphere, which was different than virtually every other place I'd been. Coffee shops can be very nice. But Aroma was a place where you could go plant your butt. And if you were just half open to it, within a few minutes, you're talking with somebody, usually a stranger, who then became perhaps a coffee shop acquaintance. Uh, funny thing about coffee shops, you, um, I, I would meet women in there. I'm a single guy. And, uh, but I, I always loved female energy. And it was, it was, it, women would come in and you chat, you know, if they're waiting and that kind of thing. I got some very good female friends there. But I called them coffee shop wives because on the street, they barely acknowledge each other. But in, in the coffee shop, it's, oh, how, how, how are you? How's the kids? Or whatever happens, it happened to be their case. See what I mean? It has a, it's a special place. It's a, it's a watering hole where everybody, almost a sacred space. Um, you can talk ideas, foment revolutions. Things did. Half of CBC went in there to write their scripts. It was not uncommon to see Dan Finkelman or uh, uh, some of the other, sorry, I forget their, their actual some of the broadcasters would come in and take coffee. They all lived in the um, annex, the premier of Ontario at the time. Uh, Kathleen Wynne was not uncommon that she would come in and hold court there. Increasingly with more, more security, the first time she came in, she was by herself. She regretted that one because, you know, well, there you go. But the thing was, it was a wonderful, a wonderful uh, place, a meeting place for all sorts of minds. So what happened? It's closed. Some others have been closing and are closing. What do you think has happened to it? The, the aroma um, adventure in Canada. Right. Uh, yeah, we had some discussions towards the end. We're, all of us who really, I would say, I use the words, word advisedly, loved aroma because of its potential for, you know, our daily social. It really boiled down to the, the fights started happening. You, you, there were rumors of people, insiders, some of whom I knew, uh, about some kind of dispute with the originators or Israel or something. Aroma Canada was, was, was going a different direction and wanted to. Frankly, it was political. I didn't really care just so long as they kept up giving me my coffee in the, the, the day. That was their thing. But another thing might have been, too, the coffee got worse and worse over the years. It started really good. That's why I enjoyed it the first day. The Roy's Cup was, was awesome. And then a few years later, maybe even not that long, we started noticing that um, they were putting less grams in the big pots. In other words, I guess that was from on high. Um, at one point, uh, Anat came in and tried the coffee. She was five years in or so. And I said, how are you enjoying? She, she asked me, how are you enjoying your coffee today? I said, it's not very good, but I don't care. See, I, don't, I really don't care about coffee. That, but not a coffee hound. I like the social. The coffee was just a black drink put in front of me that you know allowed me to stay for a few hours. So, but as far as I could determine, it wasn't all that good. And uh, then they said, well, it's franchise dictate, is dictat, whatever they call it, put in less grams of coffee per pot. And so it started to taste weak. And of course, I don't think that's unique to Aroma or anybody else. It's a corporate thing where they want to save money, right? So they find ways. I don't like Starbucks, for instance, very much, or any of the franchises all that much, because they don't put enough effing coffee in. And we you just you know it they put dark roast to make some kind of shell like like uh it's like wolf in sheep's clothing in a sense it's like yeah it's dark it tastes but it doesn't taste doesn't have that middle note coffee has a bottom a middle and a top note as you may know and uh, barista might tell you this and the top and middle notes are, are were there but the, the the sorry top and the bottom notes were there but the middle note was was missing and that's where you put that extra little bit in any coffee you make and you're going to get that mouthfeel that you love. Uh, they stopped doing that. And actually, people complained. I saw them walk out. Some, some really loyal customers says, well, you're not going to fix this. Um, fine, I'm gone. And they went forever. I think that was the kind of attrition that you can expect when things, uh, shrinkflation start, you know, hits a, a franchise like that. Now, I got to tell you, Nat did come in five years in, and I, was, I complained, not bitterly, but, you know, she asked me a question. No, I don't like the coffee much but I love the place. And she went and tried a cup. She looked at me with big surprise in her face, turned around and says, you're right. She called up head office that moment and they started putting in more coffee, just that moment. She was, she was brilliant. I really liked it, but uh, they started sneaking it. Shrinkflation crept in not too long after that again. As far as the, the legal back 
back and forth, the, the lawsuits it's about, like you said, uh -huh. they were trying to take it in their own direction and head office said, no, you signed yes. that, an agreement, you got to follow it or else. The short answer is yes, yes, we did hear about this. Anybody of us, one of us who was interested, there were four or five guys in particular. Uh, we're into politics, we're into the machinations that put anything together. So of course, this was part of the conversation when it became known that there was a dispute and that it might affect the um, aroma chain at large. I think they just expanded a little too fast. And, um, but at any rate, yes, there was, there were rumors about the legal uh, battle in process but in terms of the, the, the real weeds, I have no idea, really. I didn't, um, nobody was that forthcoming. But the rumor of closure started, I would say, even a year before it actually did close, predicated on these disputes, yes. So not my favorite thing to talk about aroma because there was so much more than coffee there. So and I don't have know. you ever gone to any other aromas or that's the only one you ever tried? I know I did try a, a couple of others, but they didn't have the bar. Uh, so I'm not interested in table I want a coffee shop with a bar. That's me. That's what I want. And the ones that I went to, at any rate, none of them, I mean, zero of them had that big, beautiful bar. So, uh, yeah, I visited two or three, maybe five throughout. Um, as I say, I love that bar and the location because of the people in the neighborhood. Aroma just lucked out. They were the center of a lot of very cool conversations for a long time. We, as I went through a number of administrations, that was kind of interesting, too. I think that towards the end, when uh, they had a brilliant fellow named Gabe Tremier, who took it over from a gnat, I believe, and he was just one of these guys that people would line up to like. It, it, he, he was just an attractive owner of, a, of an inn in the classic sense. He loved people and he loved to, you know, he would make you feel special if, in fact, it wasn't just take a number. You always got special service from Gabe. Unfortunately, he died way too young at age 33, I believe. But anyway, his successors went from, I can remember pretty much all of them. They all had their take on it. There's a fellow who wanted to open a sort of a sports bar thing there. That was a, that was a dog. Um, it wasn't a sports bar, nor should it have been. But uh, it didn't hang on for too long. And then a succession of management changes, which are, us regulars survived, because at one point, one of the managers came in, she wanted to sweep everybody away and start anew because I guess their their problems were mounting in terms of who knows what bills uh, edicts from the parent company who knows what and she saw that the sins of aroma that she was taking over and paid a good deal of money for that franchise were not being addressed by the regulars so she wanted us gone but we just didn't leave because we had been there you know it, it was that kind of dynamic you had to fight for a place sometimes but we did nicely and uh, she became one of my best friends wasn't just a coffee shop it was an experience as a matter of fact I have a little um, I wrote at the time I like limericks and I wrote a limerick and this might be the best time to uh, to burden you with it Sh shall I fire away it goes something like this me 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 <clears throat> aroma does coffee and drama a raisin roll fit for your mama baristas so hot they can kill with a shot free coffee you pay for the trauma <laughs> Did you ever show that, that to anybody? Uh, well, I wanted to actually, um, it was based largely on, on the dynamics of the place, you know, the new managers, are we going to stay, are we going to go, are we going to, so that little thing came out and I didn't have time uh, before closure to send it to head office, but I wanted to do sort of a little, I wanted to do a lot of things with it, you know, put it in, in I don't know, uh, gothic script and send it along frame to them. That would have been a lot of fun, but time did not permit. And what's there now? in that spot where you used to go? Uh, what would you expect? <laughs> a vape shop. Or sorry, did I say vape? I'm in a, a, a cannabis shop. Yeah, it's called Value Buds. And any last things you want our audience to understand about what you think the future of aroma should be in Canada? What should we understand? No, I, I got no shoulds. I do not have shoulds disease. I don't know what anybody should do. But I do know that it, the reason it was successful and the reason it stopped being successful where politics got in the way and that stopped it from being successful. But the actual base, the aroma base at their first store with that big, beautiful bar was a successful business that was theirs to lose. 
and somehow they found a way to lose it. It was a great run, 13 years, a lot of great conversations, one or two limericks out of the deal as well. I've never found anything quite to replace it. The Future Bakery, which is just down the road, is now my go-to whenever I hit the city. I still have, I visit uh, uh, the Annex a lot. They do have a bar. Um, it's tolerable. You know, Aroma was one of these, these great mixes of new and old. It had an old school kind of atmosphere, friendly the way a coffee shop should be. People were up for talking and being, you know, human beings to each other. A lot of coffee shops are just sort of silent little, I don't know, rabbit holes you go into to, to avoid the world, put in your earbuds, et cetera, et cetera. So having said that, yeah, uh, they, became, they were a victim of politics and that's just sad, but that's the way the world goes. And um, at the end of the day, it was just a coffee shop, but as the saying goes, the Bible's just a book. There was a lot going on there. There are a couple of new angles to the Aroma story that I need to tell you about. Earl Gorman was no lightweight when he bought the Canadian rights to Aroma. In fact, his family were real estate developers and home builders. His father founded the Wycliffe Homes Company and later launched the Pickle Barrel chain of restaurants and the Mayfair Tennis Club and some shopping centers. And the other development is about the Israeli head office lawyers wanting the $10 million arbitrator's award set aside. When the lawyers asked the Ontario Superior Court of Justice last month to do that, one of their main arguments was they think the arbitrator who sided with Gorman was in a conflict of interest position in the case. And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality, and customer care. Today's listener shout-out goes to Norm Gardner, a former Toronto City Councillor and longtime head of the Jewish War Veterans of Canada, Toronto Post. He turned a milestone 85. Happy birthday, Norm. If you want to write to us and let us know your thoughts about the aroma stories, I'm at ebessner at thecjn.ca. Thanks for listening. Talk to you again. 